Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 413 featuring Dr. Mike Seymour. Yes, he is a doctor now, which is awesome. Uh, this is the third time that Mike's actually been on the podcast, uh, but he has been, you know, he was one of the very early, early podcasts. So he's been on for, for, for many, many years. Uh, it was great catching up with him. A lot has been going on with him, including him getting his PhD. Uh, but he's been doing some really interesting work, especially in the world of AI. And this was actually a recommended podcast that someone said, hey, you should have Mike back on to podcast to talk about some AI stuff. Uh, so it was really great having him on and to talk about that. Kristen, what did you think of uh, uh, what Mike had to share with us? Yeah, this is a very interesting podcast. A um, lot of technical stuff that you guys talk about, but uh, Dr. Mike Seymour, he talks about the neural rendering um, and also the new lip syncing technique that they use on the film, um, The Champion. It's a Polish film on Netflix mm -hmm. um, and how they put the English words in the mouth of Polish actors like seamlessly. Um, and he kind of, this brings up another subject of um, acting and technology and how that's kind of in the relationship to each other. Um, and then you guys just go into a lot of deep conversation from the shift in the VFX industry and how it is changing with the neural networks. Of course, you guys talk about AI, is it good or bad? Um, the lingual ramifications of copying work and like kind of where the future of VFX is going. So really, really interesting podcast. You guys get into a lot of Cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mike is really one of an expert in this area, and and uh, it's really great having a conversation with him. If there's someone who's going to have a good opinion about it or who can share some good perspective on it, it is definitely Mike. So I was really happy to have that and to be able to talk to him about all the cool stuff he's doing. Uh, and yeah, the, the stuff he did on the champion is really interesting. It just you know there is this debate whether you know, you do subtitles or you do dubbing and they both have problems, but he sort of made the best of everything where he literally changed the way people's mouths moved and spoke so that all the inflections would inflections would be on the right place. And it just is just way, way, way cooler. So, uh, and apparently it's a kind of a booming thing. There's going to be a lot of demand for that kind of technology. So it's really cool. I love that, watching it. Yeah, really cool to see Mike do that. <laughs> and uh, we'll definitely have some links in the pod if you want to see some examples of how that works. Uh, definitely go to FX Guide and check out the article that uh, is written there. But there's going to be definitely more links to check out in the, in the show notes. So check those out for sure. Okay, we don't have any product updates right now to share with you, but we do have uh, an event that's sort of ongoing. Kristen, tell people more about what's going, what's happening. Yeah, so you can find more about this event at chaos.com slash events, but it is started in January 31st and is going through March 30th. Um, and you can re watch a recording of the tools and techniques to visualize an eco-friendly home. Um, so you can learn how to render an animated virtual tour with Chaos Vantage and V-Ray 6 for SketchUp. So really fun. Again, chaos.com slash events to find out more about this. Perfect. And that's where we go to any of our events that we will be having. So definitely check those out. Uh, great. Now, if people want to know more about the podcast, where can I go, Kristen? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage podcast or chaos.com slash CG Garage. And if you'd like to watch us, go to youtube.com slash chaos group TV. Perfect. And uh, like I said, this was uh, uh, recommended to us uh, through our email. And if you'd like to recommend some more people to talk to us about uh, this subject or any other subject, you can always email us labs at chaos.com. Again, that is labs at chaos.com. But for now, please enjoy episode number 413 with the return of Dr. Mike Seymour. Welcome to another CG Garage where the Chaos Group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. All right, Mike. So it has actually been, I was actually looking it up. You've been on the podcast twice before, but it's been a very long time. Uh, first time you were on is it was in 2015. <laughs> and then the time after that is when uh, we did it, uh, it was you, me and Jay. And we did that in 2017. So it's still been six years since you've been on and a lot has happened. I know in 2017 you were, at that time you were getting your 
doctorate. You've since gotten it. Is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I got my uh, I got my doctorate and uh, and got a great uh, teaching research position at the University of Sydney, where I have a uh, research lab now. Oh, awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's give it let's give it a little rundown. So so let's since twenty seventeen, what's happened? Obviously, you've gotten your doctorate in a teaching position. What's the focus of your research? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's digital people, obviously, digital humans. Sure. Um, initially, that work, uh, obviously, with you, involved uh, CG, uh, yep. like computer-generated 3D people. Uh, obviously, in the last few years, that's shifted for me to encompassing also a huge interest in uh, neural rendering. And so, I guess, uh, while I continue to do stuff in what you might call traditional 3D, they have like motion capture suits here and... Um, I look at a lot of that tech. The, for better one of a better term, AI aspects uh, have become huge. So, motion capture now is a choice between a suit and using um, computer vision to do that motion capture. Uh, but just to the face uh, in particular, we do an enormous amount of neural rendering and uh, machine learning. Okay, so that is that is a big subject, and it's actually one of the subjects that, that brought me back to saying, "Hey, I should get back in touch with Mike." I've actually gotten people on the podcast uh, who've requested, and I've said, "Hey, I want to talk more about AI stuff." And someone said, "You got to talk to Doctor Mike Seymour." So I have to first of all, I have to remember to call you Doctor Mike. Uh, no, you don't. But, <laughs> but uh, but I'd like to know a little bit more about that. So let's talk about some of the AI tools you're using, some of the research you're doing in that area. And how it's actually sort of helping uh, some of those those aspects over there in, in that area. Sure. Well, I guess the biggest one, um, the most obvious one that we've done in the last sort of 24 months to 18 months is adopted neural rendering to allow somebody to completely convert a film from one language to another. So right. uh, we started with the film The Champion, and that was a film that was a Polish film shot primarily in German and Polish. Um, almost actually entirely in Polish and German. And then the film was finished, like done as in there was nothing shot in addition to what you would normally shoot. We took that film and then converted the entire film so all the actors look like they're speaking in English. And that film then got sold to Netflix. Um, so that really opened the floodgates on doing that style of work. We could show that you could basically make the film look like it was shot in English. And not even, as you know, with you doing a feature film, you do the feature film there's all sorts of quality checks that one does but the last one is a formal quality check a qc where you actually submit it to an independent organization and they check everything like one pixel out of black on the left side of frame that the levels you know that the white and they didn't even notice that we'd done any uh face changes so yeah we we're pretty comfortable that that is um a good solution but uh that that's kind of um, the most obvious use of what I like to think of as uh, machine learning for good. And you're doing, I mean, it is. Okay, so that, I, 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 that's, a good, uh, that's a good analogy. I want to get back to machine learning for good as a, as a, as a theme that we're going to be talking about here. But obviously, uh, you're the, mainly using this to changing lip syncing, right? Well, it's effectively changing lip syncing, but if I can just expand on it for a second, sure. and I don't want to go too deep too quick, but hey, it's you. <laughs> Um, so if you think about the problem of uh, the specific case of what we're up against, we're up against the fact that if we wanted to convert, say you, speaking uh, in a different language, for a start, our options are at the moment, we do subtitles or we do a dub. If we do subtitles, I have to be able to read the subtitles. So if we're quickly cutting between the two of us and you're speaking quickly, sometimes you have to dramatically alter the actual words that appear on the bottom of the screen so that people can read them in the time that's available. Mm -hmm. Now, this is kind of an atrocity if you think about it from a writer's point of view, like the writer might have expressed something quite nuanced in the language that they chose to give to the actor. And right. yet that has to be hacked because we have to get it so you can read it quickly enough before the shot changes to the next uh, cut. So then you go, okay, we'll dub it. And so, okay, well now we have the problem that you're trying to make it look like you're speaking a different language and Herein lies two problems. Firstly, we have the same thing about attacking the script because now we're trying to make words or come up with words that look like the visemes that you said in the other language. So if you have a much more accurate translation um, 
but it doesn't kind of match the lip movements. You're going to throw that out the door and go and get the less accurate translation that makes your lips kind of move when they already were moving in the other language. Now let's unpack that a little bit, right? If we do that um, and I gave you a line and there's like an acting school thing where people say, um, you know, like if you were doing improv, I'm going to give you a line and then you give it back to me. And so let's say that line is, um, I really need a coffee right now. Okay, how many times can you say that? So I really need a coffee right now. Or I really need a coffee right now. Okay. Or I really need a coffee right now. And in those three cases, we're emphasizing different parts, which is, of course, what the actor is then doing on top of what that screenwriter delivered. Now, if I say I really need a coffee right now, but in a different language, the I part of that doesn't fall at the beginning of the delivery of the line, like in Korean, for example, like it might fall at a different point. The, the way that English is constructed doesn't necessarily translate to other languages. So the emphasis has to move. Yet we've now got a dubbed version where I have to, whatever the first words that come out of my mouth in the foreign language, have to pick up on that super emphasis that I placed on the word I. So now if you think about it, we're changing the emphasis that the actor is giving to the lines not based on the script, not based on the actor's choices, but simply matching mouth movements. Right. And so we've, we've now disrespected what's going on with the scriptwriter. We're now disrespecting the actor. Um, and so, you know, like the whole process is taken out of the hands of the director and just done as a technical exercise. And I don't have any problem with that. And I certainly think that subtitles have their place. And I would never suggest not doing those, especially for the hearing impaired. But if we want to be respectful, we should be trying to deliver the line in the new language with the emphasis in the right place to correspond to the subject and the acting choices that the actor made. So we're not just changing the lips in a sense of like a kind of, um, do you remember that old TV kids show, Captain Pugwash, where you kind of paste in the lips? Yeah, um, I can't yeah, remember okay. that. Yeah. So we're not doing that, right? Because right, if you right. did that, you wouldn't carry forward any of the other facial emphasis that happened. Sure. So what we want to do is kind of be respectful to the actor and say, how can we deliver a better delivery of the performance that emphasizes the right words at the right time and doesn't require us to mangle the script, mangle the directional magnet of the acting choices with one huge overriding proviso. If we did this badly as a subtext, like as a subtitle, sorry, you'd read it and you'd go, that's kind of an odd translation. And mm -hmm. Lord only knows, I've looked at English translations of English shows and thought that's an odd kind of word choice. If you do a bad dub, then you get something that's comical, right? Like in Wayne's World, they mimicked it. Like, you know, the, oh, 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 I right. feel now that we are not walking in sync. Right. Now, there are lots of comic, it's funny, right? Sure. But if we do a bad job with the facial reenactment, with the neural render, you're going to think it's bad acting. Mm. Now, that's a really big difference, right? Because right. now you're saying that this actor can't believably make me think that they are a father that's upset their child is dead. Yeah, that's completely different to me thinking that's an odd choice of words for the father or that looks a bit silly. Um, I find that distracting with the, uh, with the dub. So we have this real responsibility to deliver on performance, on direction and, and the subtext of what is actually being said so that you think that this actor is the character that they're playing. And if we get it wrong, we're hitting at the very livelihood of an actor and their international reputation. And that's like a pretty big deal. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that. But suddenly, you know, American shows, for example, or American movies get translated into millions of languages around the world because a lot of countries like, you know, Spain has, a, has, a, has like five actors that translate all the movies. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and they're very famous and 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 well known. Actually, some of those those translators, but there has got to be a responsibility. And I'm sure in the movie you did was the director involved in directing the voice actors to give the right emphasis, right? Yeah. So what happened with us is that Adapt Entertainment came with this uh, project, and so they wanted to do this, mm -hmm. and we were involved, and I was involved in scoping out how to do it and working out the process, and then. We uh, used uh, and worked with Pin Screen in Los Angeles, Hal Lee's company, oh, yeah. to, for the neural rendering stuff. And so we put together like a pipeline to pull this off. But we said at the outset, when you're talking about disruptive technology, instead of trying to just upend everything, 
couldn't we kind of be disruptive without having to be disrespectfully disrupting? In other words, could we kind of like not have to break everything and just come in like a bull in a china shop? So we suggested, and this is what happened on The Champion, the director was actually involved again in directing the talent. And then we said, can we get as many as the original cast back uh, as is reasonable? And so out of the 20 actors, 10 of them were original cast. Mm. Now, the process doesn't require that, but we had really good actors. And the other thing that I liked is that their voices matched, of course, from, uh, you know, because there's a sort of an inherent thing. You, you, it's pretty flexible, but sometimes a voice doesn't match a face. You'd be surprised how much it can, but <laughs> nevertheless, right. if the original actor was making decisions and choices, um, then we'd have that informing their new performance as well. And so luckily our lead actor, who was just brilliant playing the role of Teddy, like a phenomenal actor. I got to talk to him after the process at some length about this. And at the end of the sort of conversation, I said, okay, so if another actor that's a friend of yours came up to you away from us, away from the publicity and said, mate, I've been offered a chance to do one of these things, should I do it? Would you say it's a good thing to do or not? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I, I found it a good experience. So he thinks it's a different performance than the one he gave in the film. Being sure. somewhat of a method actor, he like lost heaps of weight. He uh, you know, went into training because he was a boxer. Sure, and he sure. is out of that condition physically um, when he's re-recording the dialogue because he didn't go into you know, months of training for the re-record. Right. But nevertheless, he thought it was a valid performance and a different performance. And the director echoed the same thing. It's like a, it's a different version of the film, but it's, it's true to the intent of the writer, the director, and the actor. And so we feel like we you know, had a win there. Well, absolutely. I mean, considering the choices of having someone else dub it who may not have any notion of the director or subtitles, this is definitely much closer to the original intent, at least, you know? So, uh, yeah, for sure. The, a little bit of trivia, I'm sure you know this one, but for some of our listeners will remind you that the concept of uh, dubbing is actually the origin name of the Arnold Render. <laughs> Uh, because uh, Marcos uh, came to the United States and watched a Arnold Schwarzenegger film, and he was so used to seeing him dubbed in Spanish with a very beautiful voice that he was shocked by Arnold's voice. And after that, uh, he became obsessed with Arnold, which uh, became the name of the renderer. <laughs> yes, and I have an Arnold is numero uno t-shirt uh, <laughs> as a consequence. <laughs> yep. So those, that's a fascinating thing. Now, uh, the, the technology that's been used, obviously, for, for some of these, uh, um, these uh, neural networks, is it similar technology that was used for um, uh, deepfakes in some ways? To an extent, um, it's in the same family. But of okay. course, in a deepfake, you would be putting your face on my body. In my right. case, I'm changing my face to have my face deliver a different line. Okay. Um, so we've done a test where I, sp I, you know, obviously we do a test with me because I'm free. Um, <laughs> um, and we had me not speaking at all, just standing there kind of nodding. And then we completely animated all the dialogue I said um, okay. with my face not moving at all. And so that's different than if you'd swapped somebody else's face onto my face. Um, okay. Yeah. So what's driving the reenactment are you taking video of the person doing the new line and using that to drive the other one or is it just doing it yeah, based have, on audio cues i think uh, no it's more than audio cues but i think the thing that we should always establish in these discussions is that like and you know this really well there is no ai or a thing that is ai there is sure. no single machine learning what you have is a process that involves a bunch of tools many of which um, are machine learning so we have a we have a, a range of tools that get deployed to pull off what we want to do, the majority of which are based on um, we film the voice actor recording the new line. We learn their face. We obviously learn the face of the actor in the film, and then we, um, we control the actor's face in the film. The thing mm. is, though, what we don't do is put dots on the face. We don't have special lighting rigs. We don't have. We do have um, multiple cameras set up. The reason for that is so that if you... Well, let me just do a note, diversion and say, as a complete aside, a lesson I learned that I brought into this. Ages ago, I was talking to um, an absolute top of the line uh, cinematographer, an Australian, just Academy Award winning uh, cinematographer. And I asked him about what he thought of these new digital cameras at those stage. They were not necessarily widely used. 
Mm -hmm. And I was really keen to have this deep technical discussion with him because, um, it, you know, he's just a renowned uh, cinematographer. So I say to Dean, hey, you know, what do you think of these new cameras? He goes, oh, I love them. I was like, great. This is going to be a good discussion. It's like, so we're, I've read some like, you know, cinematographer society function, right? And so I'm like, oh, let's, you know. So what is it that you like most about them? Now, what I expected to get was a discussion about latitude or whatever. And he said, I love them because we don't have to interrupt the actors to keep changing the mag. And I was <laughs> like, of course, right? Like sure. if you're a really good cinematographer, a really good cinematographer, then you're going to do what it takes to get a good performance on screen. And if that means not interrupting the actor's performance, that's what matters. Right. Okay, so now I'll go back to your, your question about the camera. So we, we set up five cameras around the actor. So if okay. they are delivering lines, uh, they can keep the flow going and we don't have to interrupt them because we now need a side shot or a front shot or a three-quarter shot. And so we just set them up. It's unintrusive. They're in the middle. There's sort of some even lighting so we can see what's going on. But we don't like go, oh, wait, this shot, we need to have the camera high. Oh, wait, this shot we need you know, from the left, this shot, we need to change the lighting. Yeah. We just sort of set it up. They're all running in sync quietly. And then we just step back and let the director work with the actor. And so it seems like more tech than you would need. And the answer is it is. Uh, but there's another really good example of that. In the film, as I said, we didn't have anything shot um, in addition to the normal film to make the process work. And so one of the sort of aspects about that is that we needed to have incredibly short training material. Like one of our shots is under a second. It's like 22 frames long. So we have to be able to solve with 22 frames of effectively training data that face before we then reenact it with the new. Now, we have a lot of processes to do that, but um, it's the same thing. We didn't want to say on set, hey, stop. Okay, everybody, step back. We're going to come in now and do some special stuff or between each take or each lighting setup, I want you to go through this uh, range of motion tests or something like that. So we didn't want to interrupt the acting process. And I learned all of that from Dean Semler's comment about changing the mag. It's like, you don't want to come in with a disruptive technology with this arrogant approach that it's so cool, this tech, and stand back, guys, I'm going to show you how we do it. Right. Um, I might have been a little more like that when I was younger in my career, but I've learned some humility in the uh, intervening years. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think all of that is actually uh, something that's very important and that we forget about sometimes. You know, I actually remember a similar story when I was with uh, uh, on working on Oblivion, and I got a chance to hang out with Mr. Cruz for a little bit, and he was talking about the the, the fact that they created these these projections of the, all the environments behind them to get the proper reflections inside a very shiny space. Which, by the way, now we do constantly with LED walls. But uh, uh, but Oblivion he was, was a very he, very good, you know, north star on that. Yeah, yeah. But he he like the Tom was places like you know. It was so much nicer than being on a green screen because I could feel like I was there. <laughs> you know, I was in this house in the sky and it felt like I was in a house in the sky. Uh, and that was kind of a, 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 a truth that, it, that he put out there. And I was like, yep, you know, sometimes it's, it's nicer than just being on a green screen. And we've done a lot of green screens these days. So it's nice to sort of break through that, that process and give actors uh, some, some helpful tools to make their, make, let, allow them to do their craft, right? Yeah, I mean, you can do black box acting, obviously. Sure. But loads of actors say they love getting in wardrobe, for example, because yeah. it helps them find the character. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I I think it's easy to be dismissive of actors um, until you try doing it or you step in front of a camera. Yep. And then it's just really quite scary. Like, it's quite scary and quite a lot harder than you think it's going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Early in my career, I was... We were waiting for an, a major actor to arrive in a sound booth session. And so we were re-recording sound to do some special effects stuff. And uh, I was junior. And so the senior visual effects supervisor said, Mike, just step into the sound booth and we'll go through it with Mike so we can sh show you what we, what we want. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so I go into the sound booth and I put the headphones on and turn around and there's just a wall of faces staring at me, right? Right. And it'd be like, I'd be, they'd be like, okay, Mike, so just deliver the first line. And I'd be like, I, I really want a coffee right now. And they go, one second. Okay, Mike, we just like that again. Okay, Mike, that'd be great. Just a bit more emphasis this time. Right. And I'd be like, you know, it's like terrifying. And so sure. I very quickly in that session learned to zero in on the director, like completely ignore everybody else 
and just whatever he said, it happened to be he, whatever mm. he said, I was going to do that. And I had my faith that they was not going to look like an idiot in front of everybody if I just sure. did what he said. Sure. Now, that was a sobering experience because up until that point, I was like sitting back, you know, near craft services, like pff, acting, right? Like, what are they going to do? They don't have any technical challenges. Huh. Sure. And then I was like, oh, okay, these guys are actually doing something hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if they do it and, and they nail it, it's just a beautiful thing to watch, you know, and they nail that performance amongst all the stuff that they have to deal with. Uh, is the boom in the right place? Did they make the, did they hit the mark? Did I do that? Did I end it? You know, just some incredible stuff that uh, that they do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, this is very interesting. I love the the, the fact that you're, you're, you're doing that and you're able to, to, you know, give us a process of what that is. What was, how long did that, pro- I mean, because an entire feature film, redoing everyone's... <laughs> performance in some ways uh, must be time consuming or was it or how how do how was it how was it that in terms of the work well yeah we can do an entire feature film three months from way to go so wow that's recording the audio and then changing everyone's face and changing the entire film but obviously it doesn't count the remix time for the audio team to do whatever remixes they want to do post okay because once we're finished the process um, they, somebody obviously has to embed the English, if, if we're coming from another language, into the uh, M&E that's happening right. on the track. Right, 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 right. Okay, so it's, uh, maybe akin to doing a stereo conversion on a, on a feature at some point. Yeah, and of course we don't have to have all final visual effects done because lots of visual effects shots are like explosions and stuff. We don't translate tra- explosions. Right. So, <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm not allowed to discuss what, but we're working on something right now where that's exactly the case. That's like an action film, lots of shooting, lots of effects and stuff. And we're like, we don't need any of that. We just need the sort of, typically, not always, typically the majority of the um, dialogue is in non-effect shots, if unless it's like a, I don't know, like a Superman Marvel hit kind of movie where they're always in some digital costume. But if you think about it, like a lot of the time you'll have the, action sequence the driving the whatever and there is not a lot of dialogue in that compared to discussing the plot or discussing the whatever um, that happens at the warehouse before they get in the chase right yeah yeah i can imagine i can imagine okay so uh so what is what is the uh what are you you mentioned the ai for good which is a new thing that's been going around these days, right? Uh, so that implies that there's AI for bad, <laughs> shall we say. Uh, but there is definitely a, an idea that AI is going to disrupt a lot of things. And sometimes it's been very helpful and sometimes it's been, uh, uh, some people find it to be uh, unethical in some ways. What are your thoughts about it in the visual effects industry or in the computer graphics in general? There's a lot of stuff that's happening around the, the machine learning process. Uh, or the many different processes in, that include machine learning. Uh, what are your thoughts about that in terms of how we need to address some of those issues and how we think about these things and classify for good or not for good or, or, what, or what that means? Yeah, I guess for me, it comes back to what I was discussing before about respect. Like, are we respectful to the creatives involved, be them writers, directors, actors, whoever? Um, that's sort of like my starting point. The ethical line I think is already fairly well understood. It just needs to be reapplied in a new context. Like you can't take my likeness and use it to advertise something without my permission. You can't impersonate me and present me doing something unless it's done satirically in a comedic way, like on Saturday Night Live. And like the fact that you are got a digital makeup versus having prosthetic makeup, like that's not really a line that is sort of an ethical conundrum. We already know what the ethical solution to that is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But here we've got uh, a few copyright issues, like is it it ethical or if you like, is it inside the boundaries of accepted practice, uh, what training data I use? So could I use training data review from one movie and then apply it to another movie for a different studio? Like that's outside the obvious lines of what's going on because you could argue, well, I'm not using the imagery, I'm learning from the imagery. Um, And similarly, stylistically, uh, you've got the respect issue. Like, am I copying somebody's work in the way that you and I might be making a film? We've got, you know, this should be like a David Lynch kind of shot. Like, imagine David Lynch, but done in Pixar, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'd go, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that kind of looks like, right? Um, Now, that's 
not disrespectful to Lynch or the Pixar artists, but if I tried to do a Pixar film without Pixar and make it look like Pixar by using AI um, and or, you know, blatantly kind of pass stuff off as being like that nod and a wink, um, mm -hmm. then I feel like that's disrespectful and ethically very dodgy. Um, so AI allows a machine to learn something by looking at it. Now, the trouble is, I don't know about you, but like I speak in analogies all the time. I'll be like, sure. oh, it's like, you know, that shot in Top Gun um, when, you know, Ed Harris has the jet going over the top and the building kind of lifts off in Maverick and everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I've got that as a reference point and I know what you're talking about and I'm going to... Now, machine learning is doing that, but just on a vast scale. So is it wrong to learn from stuff that's out there? I would argue no, but if you do it in a disrespectful way to the artists and to the uh, owners of the material or the actors involved, then yeah, it is. Um, but what so is that level of respect? Fact, right is there can you classify that in some ways <laughs> well i think i think at some point um it's a little bit like uh art you know like i don't know what it is but i know when i like it and right. i feel like you can say well yeah this is an homage to something and completely valid and this is a ripoff or a copy and as i say that applies away from machine learning so i think those things we can understand i think also because we can change the performance of actors and because we can change the performance of how things are shot, we need to be careful that we don't change things and people still believe that they're the original auteur's interpretation. So if I change your performance dramatically, it's no longer your performance. And as I say, if I do that badly and therefore you look like a bad actor, they're going to discredit you and it'll affect your career. That's disrespectful. Mm. If uh, I am editing... I can improve your performance by cutting around you. And, and we've seen mediumly bad performances improve dramatically in the edit because a really good editor mm -hmm. has, uh, you know, worked their magic. Um, but also you could imagine editing an actor very badly, deliberately to make them look bad uh, as a nasty kind of thing. And we've also seen that, you know, in social media, someone will take something out of context and so that would be disrespectful. And I feel like um, whether it's whether we use the word ethics or not, it's certainly disrespectful and shouldn't be um, applauded or encouraged. Whereas, you know, if I can improve a performance because I use two actors or I... Uh... Now, here comes the rub. And I don't have the answer to all these questions. Like right now, if we had your video, we could neural render your face to turn it a bit more to the camera. Sure. Uh, we could certainly easily change your eye line and... Yep. Now, if they and videos doing that, do and it looks a little creepy. <laughs> and yet, it can look really, really good as well. Sure. Um, I was interested at the Bake Off this year that there was like two or three instances of strong use of uh, machine learning, mm -hmm. but it really wasn't there in force. I think that's because it's now happening in films, and those films haven't been released yet. So either next year's Bake Off or the year after will be everything will be wall to wall machine learning. Um, but I know that I went to a a, uh, a technical conference mm -hmm. about two weeks before I went to the Bake Off. And at that, almost every paper was on machine learning. Right. And so there's this tsunami coming through. I just don't think it's hit the cinemas quite yet. Um, but we're going to see an enormous amount of changes to actors, changes to uh, processes using machine learning. And undoubtedly, that'll get like pendulum too far one way and we'll all be like, oh, God, you know, it's just, I, you know, hate that. And then it'll swing back to a kind of a place where it should be. Yeah, I think I think it's true. I think there's been a lot of stuff that's happening recently that's that has concerns. I do remember, you know, just before the pandemic, I myself was on a couple of panels, and one was actually uh, specifically the Screen Actors Guild. They were concerned about deepfakes, right? And they were concerned in many ways. Obviously, they didn't want their likenesses be ripped off for selling products that they were not paid to do. But they were also concerned about the fact that they wouldn't need to be on set for as long and therefore be paid less because they would deepfake most of the rest of it. And it was kind of this thing where, you know, you're borrowing the image, right? And then you just uh, somehow just... The data set is can be purchased. Let's just put it that way. That sounds an that's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
the 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 natural sort of answer to this is there will naturally be disruption. I mean, there's going to be sure. instances that one can point to where people are worse off, people are better off. I do 100% believe that jobs won't so much go away as people that know how to use machine learning tools will take jobs that are going and people that don't know how to use machine learning tools will find it harder to get work. Um, but I'm not seeing, you know, like wholesale uh, throw out, you know, shitting actors. I think, right. you know, every time technology kind of happens, you get these weird disruptions. You know, was it a good thing that digital cinematography allowed people that aren't professional cinematographers to produce these gorgeous cinematic looking imagery? Like most people would say yes, but it also kind of killed the corporate video market, right? Because there was just no need for a corporate video market. You either have high end or you just have anyone that's you know got half a skill set to be able to pull off a shallow depth of field. So, you know, um, there's always disruption uh, sure. and, and that, does then find a new equilibrium. The question you need to ask yourself with machine learning, and the one that I ask a lot, so I'm, I mean, I should ask you this question. Do you think that machine learning is an instance of more digitization or something that's actually different and thus a revolutionary step? Because for a lot of stuff that's happened in the past, the benefit or the change has just come about taking a process and making it more digital. Um, but you could reasonably argue, I think, that... Well, I guess, what, what's your opinion? Well, le there's a lot of ways to unpack this. I'm, I'm going to, although I, I do want to talk a little bit about a lot of text-to-image stuff because that's, uh, that's been very disruptive in some ways. But bes be before we get into some of the ethics of that thing, I would say that the interest in art has boomed <laughs> since text-to-image technology has come out. There is so much stuff that people are making way more art is being made today than ever has been made because these tools have sort of enabled people that didn't necessarily uh, have the uh, uh, the uh, the craft of actually creating these images to be able to do to create something that was inside their head right now what's also I find fascinating is that there a lot of people have got some really crazy ideas inside their head <laughs> and I'm seeing a lot of very weird and very interesting things that are being created. So to me, that's very exciting from someone who who loves the idea of art in a lot of ways. Uh, but uh, so, so I do think that more art is being created now than ever has been in the past because of this. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, you brought up, uh, you brought up digital cameras. Um, um, I remember actually specifically an interview with uh, John Waters, a famous uh, B, B movie director, and someone asked him, you know, this is back when they first made HD camcorders, right? And they said, oh, you know, what, the fact, what do you think about the fact that anyone can sort of pick up a camera and make a film now? And he goes, I think it's great that everyone can do this. Not everyone should. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> But uh, but I think that there is something that's being really interesting about it, uh, you know, on a positive side. Now there is definitely some ethical issues that I think we should we should discuss in here uh, that people are very upset about. Um, what are, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> well, firstly, I think the art question is a really tricky one, but it has to be contextualized if you are going to discuss art in modern art. And the bottom line is. You know, when Jackson Pollock is uh, using his drip technique, people were like, oh, my God, the guy's just spilling paint and he's drunk. And like you're telling me that, like, you know, this is art. This is just ridiculous. Right. Australia paid like, I think, one point about one million dollars for Jackson Pollock's blue poles in the going to say the 70s, maybe the beginning of the 80s. Sure. That's painting today is worth five hundred and fifty million um, mm -hmm. and is considered like one of the most significant modern art pieces in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So then you go to Andy Warhol. Did Andy Warhol make all the Andy Warhols? No, at the factory, which, you know, hello, the name <laughs> gives it away. Mm -hmm. He had other people making Andy Warhols. So if you buy an Andy Warhol of- Jeff Koons know, today Elvis, as well. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So the manual dexterity required to accomplish the actual artistic endeavor has been detached from the reverence given to art. And that's before we even get to conceptual art, right? Like mm -hmm. there are, you know, people that have done concept arts of like screwed up bits of paper or canvases that are like blank pan canvases. And, and mm -hmm. the concept of what they're saying in that 
is more significant than any max dexterity about uh, you know crumpling up the paper, or closing the door, or or hanging the, the uh, empty piece of paper. And if you go right back to Duchamp, right, like his uh, urinal, which was you know the ready mades. Right. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind that artistic qualities and reverence and respect is attached to something other than manual dexterity. Right. But you wouldn't want to be an artist with a really distinctive style that suddenly has their style abused disrespectfully by people just passing stuff off in their style and going holus bolus. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm all in on not disrespecting the artist, but I'm not at all of the opinion that this stuff is an art. I think anytime someone comes up with a new artistic interpretation, people scoff at it and say, that's not art. Um, you know, Picasso, it's like, it was just, this is, you know, a joke, um, mm -hmm. child kind of drawing. And, um, and of course, you know, Picasso is one of the greatest painters of all time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like I, I remember uh, I was in a, in a hotel in, in Jackson hole and all of a sudden I turned around and I saw these incredible Miro paintings. Right. And I was like, Oh my God. And I was like, and the guy said, yes, yes, they're real. <laughs> Don't touch them. <laughs> I was like, that is incredible. And then I showed it to someone and they're like, that looks like a child painted them. I was like, they're a Miro. <laughs> they're beautiful. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it is, um, it is, it is, I think there's a little bit of, to understand in that process. The process of learning from someone else's art, right? The problem I think a lot of people had is like, make this thing in the style of this person, right? And the act of actually writing down that person's name and having that person's name literally associated with some piece of art that's not theirs, that someone is taking advantage of or capitalizing on. There is, turns out, apparently, there's no precedence on this. This is brand new. Well, but is there? I mean, you know, like, honestly, I was looking at the VES Awards. Right? I'm a member of the VES, and I, yeah. up, one of the award videos comes up, and they literally had a shot out of one of the biggest films in the last year. Mm -hmm. And they said, in the style of, like, in the narration of the VES submission, and we went for this shot in the style of Terminator, and uh, uh, Terminator 2. And they were, you know, clearly referencing that film. It was a great reference. It was in no way disrespectful to uh, Jim Cameron um, or the artist that made Terminator. Sure. But by the same token, like it was cinema language, you know, like um, so it's the automation of that process that's getting people upset, right? The, right? the dehumanizing concept that it doesn't require a human and the challenging concept that we thought creativity was our last bastion, our like, uh, you know, stronghold against the machines that, oh, they could never be creative. They can do anything menial, but they can't do anything creative. And now people are saying, hang on a second, I thought the robots were all going to do dishwashing and, you know, low service jobs. And they're taking out jobs of lawyers and clerks and uh, bankers and stuff. Now, of course, we know in reality, it's actually quite hard to make a dishwashing robot and it's min min ridiculously expensive to do so, right? right. Uh, so you're not going to replace the dishwasher and you are going to replace the clerk who used to do the uh, paralegal stuff because that's sure. a beautifully automated digitized process. So it's that challenge and fear that's driving the discussion here. I would argue some of it's actually quite reasonable, but it's I don't think it's it's the, the referencing stuff. I just don't get that. Like we've been doing that forever. Right. I'm sure some cave painting guy went, ugh, 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 ugh. Like, <laughs> right. do it like Bob's over there. Right. Well, I, I, I understand. Uh, I understand. But I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to keep a fairly, uh, listen to all, everyone's point of view on this. I do think that there is, um, there is a confusion that people have with art and craft, right? Uh, and I think that, uh, first of all, the machine doesn't create the art, <laughs> right? In the same way that Photoshop doesn't take the picture, right? The person takes the picture, the person does the thing and then uses Photoshop or uses a tool to do what we want to do. So the idea of I want to see, you know, a, a, a sailboat on a lake and you type that in, the computer didn't type in, I want to see a sailboat on a lake. The, the idea of what that is came from the person that actually wrote the idea. So there is a creative process that's happening there. Now, my concept is the craft itself has always been something that's been disrupted from by technology 
forever, <laughs> right? The craft of making, uh, you know, uh, 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 buggy whips was disrupted by the automobile industry, right? That's the example that they always use for electric cars or automobiles, right? So someone who created something because it's a new technology that took over, so uh, is going to disrupt things. Um, there is precedence, like in terms of legal precedence. Do you think this, this is something that needs to go through a court system to be decided on this, on what is, you know, uh, this, how this can be disrupted in some ways? Or is it legal for people to just suck up the other people's images off the internet? It's a difficult question. I think a lot of our laws already cover things we need them to cover, and they need sure. to just be slightly modified for the new tech. Like, I don't think we're in this West, uh, Wild West where there's no rules governing this stuff and it's all... Because as I said before, like, you can't just copy somebody's image and use it the way you want you can't just modify material that's copyrighted um, if you have a image and you take it into photoshop and you draw some strokes on it that doesn't negate the copyright of the underlying image it doesn't mean that you suddenly own the copyright on the image otherwise we'd all just take the best work in the world touch one pixel and then claim it was ours right right um so there are already a lot of laws in place to help us i'm not a lawyer so i don't know i can really speak to what i think there's probably as i say finessing and uh and updating required to our laws but i feel like less of a it's less of a challenge that it's made out to be as if like somehow we've even had any of these problems before and we've had a lot of them before we just need to make sure that i mean it's moving pretty quickly right mm -hmm. um it is i think i think it's problematic in the sense that people are very upset about it right now and i'm trying to figure out how to help them uh uh make sense of it and what to do there's 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 literally people uh, who I've tried to get on this podcast, who refu who uh, who have uh, not not responded to me, but who have actually created uh, uh, GoFundMe pay, uh, 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 accounts to try to get lawyers involved, to try to create uh, go to Congress and lobby for them, uh, and it's 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 very hard to sort of see what's going to happen in this area. Stock photography is uh, going to be highly disrupted by this technology, wouldn't you think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and. And, I've, you know, it's horrendous if it's your job that gets disrupted in the process. And so, you know, I don't want anyone to be unemployed. Um, but, like, let's talk about it from the other point of view, which is, and I think uh, coding is creative, right? I think mm -hmm. that people that are really good at writing software code are not given enough credit for their creative abilities. But there's a huge percentage of people that are coding and using ChatGDP type stuff to help them complete code loops and uh and uh use and then people have been using libraries for forever and so this idea of some kind of digital co-pilot this idea of a digital assistant that's going to assist you in doing what you want to do i don't think you can put that like the, the horse is bolted the it's just you know that's going to happen right. and so i don't know i understand people not wanting to have their work included in training data sets and um but by the same token there is like a fair use uh issue as well in that you do want to have laws that aren't so prohibitive that it stops you from doing anything or allows you to you know uh reference or satirically do stuff like it's a lot of related areas so it's a pretty nuanced discussion and one that i think we're wrong to simplify by thinking that it's just all uh crazy town but yeah, for me, I'm obviously an advocate of using machine learning. I mean, you know, blatantly, sure. you know, and, but I am an advocate of trying to use it respectfully and understand what respect means. I also think that it's really important that we educate the public as to what's possible to avoid bad actors using this stuff because our best inoculation against bad actors is an informed public. Yes. You know, I, I've had somebody like at a major university, like uh, sort of an Oxford, Cambridge University level uh, professor publicly go online and declare that my research is um, horrendous and shouldn't be funded. Like no university should fund my, he basically implied that it was the Manhattan Project to democracy and that it was abhorrent that um, my university even gave me a job. And it wasn't just me, like it was me and the other professors and stuff that are working on this. Now, I get their point of view. I was kind of impressed that I created that much attention. Um, but, you know, 
the bottom line is that reaction is um, to say that society doesn't learn. So if you were to go back and show current Photoshop techniques to someone pre-Photoshop era, they'd be, well, that's the death of newspapers, right? Any picture in a newspaper could be faked and you'll right. never be able to trust newspapers. But that wasn't the death of newspapers. That was, you know, and yep. civilization didn't collapse. Now we know, right, you know, if you get a photo of Barack Obama um, in a bikini, you're going to be like, that's clearly Photoshop. Like, I don't even have to look any harder at it. It's clearly a Photoshopped image. It might sure. be satirical. It might be malicious, but it's definitely not real. Right. Um, but at the moment, the public isn't informed enough. So if they see a, a deep fake or a, a you know bad actor using stuff, then they're not aware enough to just call fake on it from an instinctive point of view of just knowing, well, hang on, that's not that doesn't seem plausible. Sure. Um, so... So the society will get better, society will learn, which is of course why old visual effect shots that I thought were amazing no longer are quite as amazing they don't when hold I look their at luster. them again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and like when people first saw that train approaching in the French uh, oh, uh, yeah. tent the and they new, all ducked yeah. and jumped out of the way because they worried that the train was actually coming at them and it was just projected. Right. I mean, of course they'd never seen a train projected, so they were astounded. Um but they learned, and now you'd need a lot of tech to convince somebody that a train was actually coming at them. You'd need holograms and stereoscopic imaging and all sorts of marvelous things because the audience is just so much more technically literate. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember very similarly. The, the, like I said, I was in the early 2020, just before the pandemic. They were, during the I was doing a talk, and they were all concerned that. The, the elections in the United States were going to be filled with deep fakes of people to try to get fake news situation. And it turns out that none of that actually really happened. Just straight up lying worked just fine. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think the other thing that I point to is this informed public thing works both ways. Because there was a um, South American politician who mm -hmm. was uh, caught on video with seven hookers jumping up and down on top of him. And... Uh, the first reaction from this politician was, this is a deep fake. I, so, you know, it's a fake. They faked the video. It's a deep fake. It's not me. They put my face in this. It's malicious, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And, and now a bunch of experts then reviewed that tape and I got to watch the tape. I wasn't on the expert panel, but I was, I know people that were, of course, explaining to my wife why I was watching these hookers jumping up and down on this uh, South American guy was kind of funny. But notwithstanding that, yeah. it was pretty clear to anyone that was a professional that was, you know, versed in the art that this was not a deep fake and was not um, digitally manipulated. But it was about a week since the thing came out and the guy said it was a deep fake before the experts had had a chance to review it, come back with opinion, and a follow-up piece went in the newspaper saying that it was fairly likely that this was, in fact, a real video. And I'd point out this politician got re-elected. So the informed public needs to also know what's possible so that people don't just say, hey, it wasn't me. No, that was I didn't say that. No, absolutely. I never wore a Nazi uniform or, you know, I never sure. did that thing that, that is abhorrent. Um, and use their ignorant, the public's ignorance about the technology as a get out of jail free card for otherwise unforgivable uh, behavior. Yeah, I, I, I agree. There's, there's, some, uh, there's some people who actually specialize in uh, digital forensics, video forensics, to, to create those things to actually identify whether things are fake or not fake. And there are is. spin doctors who come up with great excuses like, no, that wasn't, that was faked. Right. But, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, I do want to. You you mentioned digital uh, digital assistants, and this is something that you know you you were talking about many many years ago, and we were starting looking at digital humans, and that was always sort of one of your dreams is to create a very functional digital assistant based on a lot of the things that are happening right now. Chat GPT being as good as it is at having good conversations with you, uh, the technology you're using to create uh, uh, lip movements in the language that you want uh, and, and expressions that are correct and all of the things that are happening. How close are we to having a really great digital assistant? I think we're close to having a digital assistant. Oh, a great digital assistant is a slightly loaded term. Like, the, the reality is I've been very lucky in that the stuff that you and I, Chris, were discussing before and go back to like 2017, like that is, that is paying out. Like 
Yes. I generally hate futurists. I think futurists are jerks. Like I really dislike them. They always like, you know, and don't get me started on the singularity and AI taking over and, uh, you know, the whole thing about putting my brain in a jar. Like I just hate those people. Okay. That being said, it is the case that if you want to look at where the future is, you should look in the labs. And so I, I referenced that earlier with the stuff that's going on, technical papers on machine learning versus what's currently in the cinemas. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lag, right? But if you look at what's happening, we're getting, uh, we've got faces now to a point that you can produce a digital face that's indistinguishable. I mean, I can maybe pick it, you could probably pick it, you're, you're a good guy. But like a load, my wife's like, no chance I can tell that's digital, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we've been able to do that now for at least two years, like, sure. but with stills. Um, so the NVIDIA stuff and the stuff that's been done um, in, uh, in GANs has just been so terrific. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that. We've also had these huge advances in interactivity and the ability to have fast uh, renders and so we can do stuff in real time and we can thank Epic Games for a ton of really good stuff there. We've had a lot of really good algorithmic solutions, um, like the stuff that Chaos has done, the stuff that you guys have have illuminated the world in how light works, just produces this tremendous imagery, right? So that side of things is going really, really well. The thing that was lagging was what I call the cognitive cliff. So we mm. solved the uncanny valley. And by the way, again, the uncanny valley is not a litmus test of whether or not you know it's real or not. It's a sure. litmus test of whether or not you freaked out by it. Right. And um, and just to digress, like I was talking to the guys from uh, Little Michaela, and I said, you know, to them on a call, I was like, hey, how do people kind of react that as the technology's evolved, she's kind of evolved, you know, and that we joked about once they shouldn't have eyebrows, they mm -hmm. came back again. <laughs> but I was like, you know, do they care? And they went, oh, no, no, no. People don't care she's not real. They just care she's authentic. Right. And I was like, oh, my God, I want that on a T-shirt. Um, right. Because it was the authenticity of the, the digital influencer that made Michaela popular, not that the render quality was indistinguishable from real. Now, that being said, it was on the other side of the uncanny valley. But for a while there, you could look at a little Michaela until it was 3D. But sure. it didn't make you go, Ugh, that's disgusting. That's horrible. I repulse it at a kind of a DNA lizard brain level. Okay, so now we've got the imagery so that it's good enough that I don't care and I'm not repulsed by it. Mm. And we're not in feature films now, we're trying to just communicate with people. So it's not like, am I taken out of the film, which is the metric for feature film production. We're talking about assistance. Does the assistant kind of look happy and reasonable and have enough facial expression that I'm cool with it, or is it like bug me? So we're, we've solved that. But if you've solved it and it looks intelligent and it's rendered well and it moves well, but it can't answer a simple question, then you've got a cognitive dissonance between its response, its, its language abilities, if you like, and of course, how it looks. You think you should ask it a good question and it'll answer the good question because it looks so darn good. And yet it's got a you know, sub child prepubescent kind of understanding of the world. Right. And so we've had a lag in that, and that's the lag that's now picking up. So we're now seeing much more plausible language, much more plausible uh, cognitive responses to natural language questions that is solving the cognitive cliff. Whereas prior to this, I would say the last five years, our focus has been on solving the, um, the visual problem. So uh, I would argue that if I used, um, you know, modern tools to produce a digital human, I could, on a good day, totally nail it and we don't even have to discuss the uncanny valley. Yeah, right. I can make bad stuff, but but having an interactive version that does provide a sensible answer, we are still kind of at the nexus point of that being totally uh, doable. I think Alexa and Siri are kind of examples. But what they lack is what I call uh, memory or conversational memory. So when- um, ChatGPT has that. That's the thing that was so that's interesting. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. You're 100% right. I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. As opposed to Clippy from uh, Microsoft back in the day, mm -hmm. which they deliberately deleted any understanding of anything from 10 questions ago. So 10 interactions and they deleted it. So it wasn't, in their words, creepy. 
made that a disaster because you'd ask it to do something. There'd be a couple of qualifiers and then it'd ask you the first question again. And you're like, I just answered that. And right. 10 interactions was ridiculous. Yeah, chat GDP, you're 100% right, has this ability to have contextual conversations. And that is a huge step. It's like the, the subsurface scattering of digital humans. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think the only problem is it gets facts wrong very easily. <laughs> And but it, it but it, it conveys it with such conviction that he's like, wait a minute, that's not correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a very convincing friend who's a bit of a uh, a git. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, and even but, some I mean, basic math problems, I'm sure all of that can be solved at some point. But it's funny, kind of interesting that it's like. <laughs> no, no, it's true. I mean, if there is a common misperception in the world, um, the example I use is you know a woman over forty is. Uh, would, would more likely be die in a plane crash than meet her perfect husband, right? Something right. like this that's, that's completely got no basis in fact, but is so iterated in popular culture, right. it's going to come through a chat GDP as a fact, where right. of course it isn't. Um, yes. So that's dangerous. And of course, we haven't yet had the problem of chat GDP delivering answers and dialogue and... and uh, incorrect facts it's not obviously notionally it's not intentionally lying but you know misdirected misrepresented facts that mm -hmm. will go back into its own loop because gdp4 is coming real quick and then sure. of course five but at the moment most of the language learning in that comes from stuff that was uh stopped learning with it two years ago in gdp3 right. so so we've had at some point it's you know it's going to pop going to eat itself like it's gonna, <laughs> it's going to start learning from itself. And that's when we're really going to get into trouble. Yeah. 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 For sure. Well, what are some of the, I know you said you don't like futurists, which I, I understand that point of view, but what are some of the things you're looking forward to that you saw? Like you saw a bunch of papers. What is the thing that you're most excited about right now? Um, well, there's a whole lot of them. Let's just discuss VFX. So obviously mat generation, um, yes. roto, um, depth, automatic, um, stuff like that. The ability to relight a shot, uh, the ability to alter a head so it's turned a little differently to camera, to change uh, the eye line. Um, these are all really great things. Um, the big one that I would say, like that's kind of in the near term and definitely uh, everybody's interested in. In the near term, the one that's hugely interesting to me is volumetric capture and volumetric recreation. So uh, the Nerf kind of movement, basically. Yeah. So uh, how long until I can put on something that maybe looks a bit like a VR, XR kind of headgear, scan a room and record an event, and then somebody else can pick up their iPhone or iPad and just replay that from wherever they are standing in the their room. So in other words, let's say I use a birthday party. I do this for my child's grandparents. So I film the kid getting the cake and blowing out the candle. And then when they pick up their iPad and look at that, if they physically move their iPad to the left or the right, they will move the view to get around the head that was obscuring the child reaching in and, and laughing and blowing out the candle. And um, I think that's the one that's going to be uh, phenomenally interesting because I'm not saying that it's obviously will have a, a relevance to movie making and linear whatever, but it'll be a whole new sort of the rebirth of corporate video, if you like. You'll be in a shop or you'll be at a store, you'll be at somewhere, and somebody will want to have a virtualized version of that that you, it's more than just like the, sort of like another, you, know, uh, you know, the retail, they did 360 walkthroughs effectively, right? Yeah. yeah, but they were all basically just vision mapped inside a ball and mm -hmm. you looked at the ball and you looked left and right and it was true, but of course you couldn't, check out what the angle would be like if you walked around the couch because the couch wasn't a volume. And that's what will change. It'll be like a volumetric experience and volumetric experiences aimed, as I say, not at somebody putting on VR headgear because I'm not a huge fan of, I don't hate VR, but I just don't think that it's going to have commercial uptake that everyone's going to put on VR headgear and sit on their couch, you know, waving their hands around, not able to see anything in the room. My attitude is, you'll get that stuff happening and then people will experience it on their mobile devices. So they need no extra tech, no extra um, 
weird stuff and they can still second screen with the TV while they're kind of doing it and all the other things that people do in real life as opposed to in, uh, in Facebook meta um, demo yeah. reels. I, I, I agree. I think nerves are, are fascinating to me. Uh, I was always interested in what was possible with light fields, but they were always so huge and took forever to process. And then basically nerves are just a way of making light, light fields. They're basically light fields in a lot of way. Uh, and to me, what, what's possible in that is just fascinating. I'm, I'm very, very excited about the idea that I can just, I can capture and it's, and you're right, right? Like, I mean, we should explain like nerfs aren't just photogrammetry. It captures lighting from every direction as well. Like, so speculars move across things correctly when you move around them. So it's kind of a, a fascinating thing. Yeah. I tried doing a shootout between a photogrammetry new tool and a nerf tool. And I couldn't get the photogrammetry tool to have enough information before my phone kind of choked. Right. And the Nerf thing worked like a dream. And right. that was just beta software. But it was like, holy crap. And then I could play that as a film, like move through it. Mm -hmm. I could also just isolate, in this case, it was a sculpture and just spin it. I could export that as a 3D item if I wanted to polygonize it. It was just, I was like, wow. And this is all happening on my phone. I was like, man. Yeah, yeah I think it's fascinating fascinating what is what, what are your thoughts on on just like gpu technology and how that's you know the hardware that's going to change this stuff because obviously while some of that a lot of that stuff is 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 happening you know and you're doing it from your phone but a lot of it has to be done on the cloud right because you need a lot of gpu power to process some of these things so what are your thoughts on on, on how hardware is going to change and cloud computing well gpus are change? still going better than moore's law like the right. They're not even close to Moore's Law, actually, in terms of how much they're jumping forward. Um, I think latency is the biggest problem. If we can reduce latency, that's where we really get... Like, I notice in all the demos that you do with digital assistants, the problem is you ask it, hey, you know, let's say my assistant's called, I know, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Deborah, uh, you know, what's the weather? Pause, pause. The weather today, Mike, is... And I'm like, well, that seems unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, so... That we need to solve latency, and that's like a networking issue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously, GPUs and being able to have GPUs in the cloud is both great, but also the cloud is basically just somebody else's computer, right? Like, right. it's not like it's not magic. <laughs> it's like, yep. Just I'm using somebody else's computer, but I essentially though I can like timeshare it, right? So you know, sure. you and I could both be using the same notional computers in the cloud, but we're in different time zones, so. When I'm asleep, it's not being used. Yeah, so I do think that it's cost effective. I do think it's um, happening really, really quickly, and there are just such huge leaps going forward. And also, it just seems like we're at the tip of the iceberg. Like we're not into papers on optimizing this stuff at the moment. We're just in brute force slamming it because we can. Um, we're not even got to that point where people are looking for the two times improvement by just writing a better code loop, or two times improvement by streamlining this or modifying that. There are some 10x improvements to be gained from approaches right now mm. um, that, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, concerned about the power usage and the environmental kind of footprint of some of these vast um, data solutions. Because, you know, again, somebody else's computer needs power. Sure. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think I wish I'd bought, you know, shares in NVIDIA when I said to everybody else they should buy shares in NVIDIA. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. Well, listen, it's been it's been an hour and we've had a great conversation. I'm sure we'll talk some more about it. I'm fascinated about everything you're doing. Uh, where can people go to check out some of the cool projects you are doing? You know, we'll, we'll obviously put links on the page, but if you can just give people a heads up of where people can follow some of the cool stuff you're doing. Yeah, I, uh, I guess FX Guide is the main uh, place, though yeah. increasingly I'm I mean, obviously, FX Guide is my first love and FX PhD for training. But being that I have a research lab, we're sort of publishing elsewhere. Like next month, I've got a piece in Harvard Business Review because we're trying to do that thing that I was talking about, which is democratize by informing the population what's going on. And like our ethical contribution is not just publishing at cool conferences in Hawaii where, you know, let's face it, a thousand people, if you're lucky, are ever going to read the paper. Sure. Um, we need to be active in the community. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to do stuff like that and trying to do stuff at like, we've done in Australia, there's a thing called Vivid and uh, it's like, and I've done TEDx and 
Uh, I'm doing more of that kind of stuff. Hopefully, South by Southwest, if I'm lucky, um, nice. you know, here in Sydney, that kind of stuff where we can get out and show people these things and uh, talk to them. But also, you know, I genuinely love the other side. I mean, I just adore talking to you doing this stuff because, you know, it's great having people where they understand, as you obviously so do, what's going on. Um, it's always so much more difficult when you have these discussions and you you have to start at first principles. It's, it is a pretty steep learning curve. And so, sure. yeah, it's been a joy talking to you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. I mean, we've opened, you know, I learned from you uh, in, in a lot of ways when I started doing this, uh, you know, what you guys are doing at FX Guide and, and sort of inspired by that and having conversations. I had, you know, it's been over eight years that I've done this podcast, which you believe it or not, uh, which actually does make sense in, considering the fact it's been six years since I last spoke to you on the podcast. Uh, but, but yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been really amazing to have you on, um, and to see, to talk to you about this. I'm really glad you're able to talk to us about this. I'm excited to hear, uh, you know, what, what people have to say, uh, on the subject as well. So very excited to see that. And I can't wait to see the, the new film. What, the name of the film was The Champion, right? Oh, The Champion. Yeah. So the, the Champion's been done and it's been yeah. on Netflix. Um, it's on Netflix. Though, so people can check it out today in English. <laughs> yes. Though. It's a bit of a secret that I'm not meant to say publicly, but it's slightly random whether you get the English dubbed version that that was dubbed originally or the version that we did. There was some um, because, but there are other, I can't discuss projects that um, I can't discuss, but let's just say soon I'll discuss a lot of other projects um, uh, that, uh, but yeah, the champion was just the first one we did, but we finished that a year ago now. So. Right text moving so quickly but yeah, i um, do remember that yeah awesome well thank you so much mike appreciate it and uh yeah we'll talk next time thanks man